My name is Val Coles. Through the course of my professional career as a cinematographer, I have filmed commercials, music videos, weddings, and more. Always being behind the camera, this project will take me out of my comfort zone and into the realm of the unknown. With my curious nature and cinema skills, I wanted to embark on this journey to document the locations and historical findings of the community. The dark past of what some may call a simpler time. My findings are the result of countless hours of extensive research, archive samples, personal encounters, and truthfully, the unknown. The Niagara region is located in southern Ontario, Canada, between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. The region encompasses a total area of 1,851 kilometers square, with a population of over 500,000 residents. The history contained within the region is full of local myths, legends, and recorded archaeological data. Indigenous people lived and passed here over 10,000 years ago. Many people have walked these grounds. Wars and historical battles attributed to claiming this land have been recorded. The smell of black powder, the screams and loss of life can still be felt around here. Local residents learn about these topics in school, conducting field trips and exploring these well-known locations with their friends. However, many local legends have been lost in time. I'm here to find out if the Niagara region is more than just a tourist destination. In order to start my investigation, I wanted to learn more about the original pioneers, the settlers, who traveled here to start a better life. These are the people who are currently buried in a cemetery located in the city of Niagara Falls. Before I visit the cemetery, I wanted to visit one of the oldest towns in Canada, Niagara-on-the-Lake. Niagara-on-the-Lake became a town in 1792. Before that, for over 10,000 years, has been the grounds for indigenous people. Many lives were lost in this small town from wars, starvation, and disease. Today, I am visiting one of the oldest pubs in Ontario, the Old Angel Inn, built in 1789 as the Harmonious Coach House. It is reported as one of the oldest buildings in Canada. Although the inn was rebuilt after the War of 1812, the exposed structural beams and thick plank floors laid in 1815 can still be seen. Many people have walked on these floors, people including the first lieutenant governor, Alexander Mackenzie, the explorer, Prince Edward. But today, I'm here for a very specific someone, Captain Colin Swayze, a Canadian soldier who hid in one of the empty barrels in the cellar. He was retreating from the invaders with his lover, a woman he believed to be his true found love. By the time they found out the British were retreating, the invaders started to prod every corner and every barrel with their bayonets, eventually stabbing Swayze and his lover. It is said Swayze walks at night in the building, mourning for his sweetheart. He is reported as harmless, with the only condition being the British flag must be above the inn at all times, a precaution taken by the owner and staff. I have traveled here to meet up with Graham Carter to get an exclusive look deep inside the building. Graham is the general manager here, and he has worked at the pub for over 20 years. Hey. Hey, Val, how you doing? Good, how are you? Pleased to meet you. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Yeah, welcome to the Old Angel Inn. This is it. This is it. It's, uh, it's probably uh, one of the oldest still operating inns in North America. Wow. Originally built in 1789. Uh, it was called the Harmonious Coach House. Okay. Uh, during the War of 1812, it was burnt to the ground, rebuilt in about the 1830s, wow. and then was called the Old Angel Inn ever since. Wow. Uh, we um, were an old English pub. We we not changed much in a lot of years. The menu, English fare. Uh, we, um, as you can see, we have the flags outside. We have the Canadian flag, the British flag. 
Uh, and now, is that to keep Swayze happy? Well, it's been known that we shouldn't fly the American flag because when we did, yeah. that strange things happened. Okay. And we had some Americans there who put it out one night and they were, they heard noises in the hallway, they were disturbed all night. They took the flag down because they were scared. Yeah. But since we've had new owners, they decided because we have a lot of, you know, American tourists that come over, yeah. we, we try and please everybody because he's not known as being a horrible ghost. Right. Touch wood somewhere. <laughs> so he, apparently Swayze is looking for his, for his lover, right? His, essentially the... Well, that's what he, he came here. He came here to meet his lover, yeah. who was a barmaid here. Um, she, uh, when he came here, he got caught in like crossfire when, when the Americans invaded the town. Right. Uh, was sent into the basement where the, the story or the folklore goes that he was hidden in a barrel and he was uh, bludgeoned to death wow. with swords. That's I don't understand why they just wouldn't pull him out of the barrel because it must be easier putting a sword yeah, yeah. in him. They were playing that old game of <laughs> yes. just poking every single barrel. That's what they were doing. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so if you'd like to come inside. Yeah, yeah, let's go check it out. Okay. My first experience was right here in the pub. I was over by the front there, late at night, closing up. Heard a disturbance up in the in the dining room, which is just here behind me. Uh, went to look. There was knives and forks moving around on the table. I used to set the tables years ago with uh, tablecloth, wine glasses, full knives and forks. Things just started to move in on the table. As I came walking up into the dining room, something walked right through me. Hairs on my head all stood up. Uh, chills, wetness through my, my feeling. Went to look up and there was nothing there. Nothing was under the table. Uh, went and checked all the doors. Nobody around, still alone. I didn't know what was going on. And that was my first experience here. If you look right here, the beam, where there used to be stairs that went up. There's a staircase went up to the rooms upstairs. And uh, Tim, who's been here for 35 years, about 15 years ago, he was sat at the bar and he saw like stairs appearing and three ladies dressed in like long dresses from like the period of the 1800s came walking down the stairs. He couldn't explain that at all. That was a weird experience for him. Um, other things in there that have happened to me up here in the pub, uh, I used to close up by myself at night. I was at the front and a glass went from all the way around the bar. You'll see the bar, it's not one big straight line. I tried it with like making it wet and see how it would move. And no, I could never make it happen again. Glasses have moved around the bar in front of me. Uh, pictures have moved on the wall. Things have fell off shelves. Uh, creaking noises, hearing my name all the time. And I've been alone. And that's what's happened in here. All right, welcome to uh, Swayze Cellar. This is where all the action began and where it happens. And just be careful of your head when you're coming in. Some parts are very old. This is the actual, this is the original part of the cellar where they would have dropped the kegs and the, or the barrels that they would keep down there. Barrels of wine, barrels of ale. When you come into this part, you say be careful of your head. You'll see the outsides of the building. The far wall is original stone. This is all that was original stone that was here. This part right here is where the story comes of Captain Colin Swayze, who was a, uh, he was a captain in the English army during the War of 1812, believed to be trapped here, and was ambushed by the Americans who came down here, and he was hiding in a barrel, and the story goes that he was bludgeoned to death in the barrel. And the rumor is it's the captain that walks around in the Angel Inn. The, the hallways, the basement, the rooms upstairs. Uh, 
people have seen images of him. Uh, me personally, I've never encountered a full image of a like an old soldier, but I've definitely felt the presence. And uh, um, maybe one day I'll see him. I don't know. But as you can see, this all the outside of here is the original stone. It's probably local stone from the area, uh, from the escarpment. Goes back in there, all around the outside, because this is the front of the building, uh, which would be Market Street. And then on this side, that would be West. That would be uh, Regent Street. And uh, there's not so much happens down here that I've heard from the staff, other than staff have uh, felt when you've been getting wine and changing kegs, there's some staff that don't like to come down here because they're scared. They don't even like going to washrooms down here. Uh, so they send other people to come get wine, supplies, change kegs. When they go, um, he has been seen uh, one, one of the girls was getting wine from here and she felt somebody come up behind her and grab her. And when she turned around, there wasn't anybody there. She screamed and came running up and said she would never come down here ever again. And she has. A simple jewelry store located directly next to the Old Angel Inn is an apparent hotspot for strong poltergeist activity. I wanted to find out more, so I met up with one of the shop owners, Sheila Moolman. Okay, this building alone is actually not an old building, but prior to that it was a house. Um, a lady named Elsie lived here and she took in a lot of orphan children. Um, eventually they pulled down the house and they built this store. However, the whole place is so haunted with so many things. We think it's more soldiers um, from 1812 and on one occasion I was sitting right here and something happened behind me and all our technical books were thrown off the shelf and thrown over to the front door. Um, and then we had to go and pick them up and, um, and that was just one, one thing in many, many things that has happened here. On another occasion, which was very strange, was it was in the middle of uh, January, February, it was thick snow outside, there was not one person in the street and I was downstairs and I heard the door open and so many people came into the store. They were stamping off their feet, they were stamping the snow off their feet, they were laughing, coughing and it appeared to be quite a few men. When I came back upstairs to see, well, can I help anybody up here? There's so many people. There was not one person in the store. And when I opened the door, there wasn't one footprint. I assume these were the soldiers. Escaping Niagara in the Lake, we travel to our next location. While driving, we encounter a strange looking building on the side of the road, a building we had to document. We had to check this place out because we saw it from the side and this is one of those prime examples of a location that has been completely abandoned. So let's go knock on the door, see if anyone's home. Even the rain gutter is completely collapsed. You don't see that in modern houses. open the door all you smell is like really really old wood and while I was knocking at the door the wood is like really soft this is something out of a movie do you hear something yeah <laughs> Hello?
I heard something. Did you hear that? Yeah, I, heard that. I don't know what that was. Though. Yeah, I don't know who lives here. This place has just been completely left uninhabited. Look at this. The, the, the tree fell completely. And it was just left here. Now, as I'm looking through the windows, you can still see inside that there's like little cups, little kitchen accessories, and someone just got up and left. I don't know. Clearly no vehicles are here. There's a tree right in the middle of the driveway. This, if any place gives me the, the shivers, the chills, this is, this is the place. So uneasy. I feel like I'm not wanted here. It's a, it's a whole different atmosphere. Let's go around this other side of the building. Okay, we're on the other side of the house right now. I wanted to show you guys those curtains. There's, there's a hole, there's multiple holes inside the house. And it doesn't look like it burned down, it just looks like it's just been left since like the early 1900s, just completely uninhabited. Looks like they did repairs in the wood right there with some steel or something. Whoa, 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 whoa. that way. I think I just saw someone in there. Hello? I don't know. Uh, yeah. You guys have to check this out. Look at the basement. Look at the windows in the basement. Can you get over here? Yeah. Really creepy. Looks like it would have been like maybe kitchen counters or something. What do you think could have happened there? It's just destroyed. We lose audio and start to panic. Noticing a recently smoldered fire, we realize we aren't alone. The smoke and a recently placed barbecue lighter was enough to send us running back to the vehicle. We are now heading to a location named the Screaming Tunnel. The well-known tunnel has three variations of a very similar story, each ending with a young woman being burned alive and making it to the middle of the tunnel. The locals say if you light a match in the middle, the woman will blow it out. I'm traveling here to find the old farmhouse where the woman ran away while still lit on fire. Since the house itself burned down over 100 years ago, we are in the hopes to at least find some of the remains of it. So there's three unofficial stories, urban legends, that relate directly to the screaming tunnels. Story number one is a father chased a girl and doused her in gasoline right inside the tunnel. Story number two is a girl was burned inside a house that was collapsing and then she ran inside the tunnel because there's it's always wet down here and maybe hoping for to survive and story number three husband got divorced with his wife and he doused her in gasoline and essentially she ran directly in the tunnel where she further passed away whichever story they all kind of relate together to a point where as the story goes if you light a match in here, inside the tunnel, the match will blow out and there'll be a gust of wind. Even if there's no wind outside, like today, if you look at the leaves around me, they, they're barely moving. The trees around me, there's no wind out right now. I think the wind is at like two kilometers an hour, so... We're gonna go inside the tunnel and we're gonna find out if, if there's a tension there. 
I immediately, like when we parked here, like there's an, an, an immediate sense of just, I don't know, it's a little bit dark. I, I can't really explain it, but let's, uh, let's go inside. So right about, right about here is where you feel like in your gut, it's a little, something's not right. You know, something happened here before. You, it's like, a, it's like a flashback of history. Uh, it, it becomes part of you. This is like the invisible line. So let's walk deeper into it. But yeah, we're, we are gonna go past the tunnel. We're gonna go directly into the forest area over there and hopefully find the exact farm where the girl ran from, so. So just this way, apparently there's the farm. So this trail splits up into three ways, so we're gonna, we're gonna make a left of the tunnel. Continuing along our search for the burnt down farmhouse, we end up in a field. During filming, we are approached by a vehicle. My onboard audio disconnects. However, we are able to recover some dialogue. This proves to be a crucial piece to our investigation later on. At this moment, we are as shocked as ever to discover the man approaching us in this mysterious vehicle was no other than the landowner, Don Wilson. Here is the audio we have recovered. Right. The, the story about the girl and the thing is over. If you walk up here and you go across uh, and then look to the left, that's where there was supposedly an old house. There was the original homestead, and it was apparently the daughter of whoever lived in that old uh, place. I've never walked back in there to see if, in fact, there's any remnants. I don't know that. But the story about the railroad underpass here, okay. Screaming Tunnel, has been is built into a, a huge myth and people come from all over North America. Okay, so Don, uh, the, the vehicle that actually got here, um, awesome owner, he actually owns the land. What, what a weird coincidence. We were just happened to be filming here today at this time and he just shows up in his fancy car and just, yeah, that was weird. It's, it's, anyways, uh, he was pointing out that there's a, there's a tent there. He actually thought it was ours. So we're gonna check out the tent because apparently somebody camps here, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare to camp here. It's uh, probably really eerie at night, but I'll check it out. I, I hope there's nobody in here. That would be a, kind of an odd surprise. They, they wake up and there's a there's a camera in there too. Hello? Anyone in here? We're shooting a documentary. Realizing we have a long walk ahead of us, we start the walk to our vehicle. Okay, so the gentleman that uh, that owns this land, he he told us it's straight this way and make a left, and we should see the old house that burnt down, or what's left of it. So I guess we're gonna drive down this this terrain, and look for something. Now the reason the reason I took my car out here is because we could be walking for miles and not find anything with the vehicle it's just a little bit more accessible uh, we are running out of light slowly oh look there's a hill up there yeah. I think it's up there this is quite the adventure quite the drive yeah. yeah this is definitely farmland so the house should be around here somewhere he did say it was a trek through the woods I think yeah. what I'm hoping to find is some some foundations you know just anything because foundations aren't usually made out of wood but it was an old house, so who knows what we'll find. So here's more, here's more farmland here. Okay, well, we'll keep driving and see what else there is to see. Following the lead Don gave us, we drove for over 20 minutes with no house ruins in sight. We do, however, find the original farmland that surrounded the house. While no longer in service, we can imagine this farmland once served a purpose for the residents that lived here. Hey guys, so we've been driving for about 20 minutes and we can't seem to find the ruins of the old house. I don't know, it could be somewhere over there in the bushes, but we literally ran up all up and down this road and unfortunately we can't find something. But what we did find is this right behind us. Actually, where we're standing is most likely the original farmland. Hundreds of years ago, this used to be the land of indigenous people. And you can just imagine when, you know, when people took over this land, you know, how many people walked on here, how many people farmed on this land. We're gonna go ahead and see if 
So as we were taking this trail back to the Screaming Tunnel, we stumbled upon an Anukshuk and some steel bars or some sort of metal. If you come over here. Really, really old pipe. rusted in the pieces. I don't know what this could have been. It's like bent metal. Anyways, we're gonna continue on our journey. Hopefully we'll run into something else. Hey buddy. So we just got here. We're going back to the tunnel. And there's just a random dog sitting here in the middle of the road. I don't know where the owner is, but... Anyways, this is my new friend. Do you know any stories about the Blue Ghost Tunnel? Or the Screaming Tunnel? Do I, you know any urban, urban legends you want to speak of? Well, he's very good on the documentary. Yeah. Very odd day. Interesting. Leaving the Screaming Tunnel has taught us how powerful nature can be when left alone. This location expresses perfectly how time can replace history. We can only imagine how much life has changed over the last 200 years. The past may not be so lost after all. As we prepare for our next location, we learn about a similar tunnel with a very different purpose and history, the Blue Ghost Tunnel. So I'm getting everything set up now. We are heading to the Blue Ghost Tunnel. It's gonna be quite dark there, so I'm gonna to have to bring all my lighting equipment. Unfortunately, I can't bring anything that plugs in to the wall because there's no outlets there. So portable light, it's gonna to have to do. I'm bringing this big camera with a really big sensor. This is gonna provide us with the best, you know, low light performance. And this big gimbal, so, um, Optimally, we have about an hour left of sunlight, which should give us enough time to at least get there. It's about a two kilometer walk uh, down this concrete road path where, where cars uh, used to used to be. It's, a, it's an old GM plant. So yeah, we'll see how it is. Hopefully we won't run into any people there. And if we do, we'll maybe interview them or something. See, see how often they go there and stuff like that. Okay. We just went down a little trail, we parked the vehicle, and now we are expected to walk all the way down that road. Hopefully onto the Blue Ghost Tunnel where we are going today. And our mission is to find the original tunnel where the two trains collided. So the, the trains essentially collided within 100 yards of, of the tunnel. So let's go onward. We have a little bit of a hike to go and we'll see what we see on the way. As we start our journey to find the legendary Blue Ghost Tunnel, we have a 1.5 kilometer long walk ahead of us. Deep into the distance, we see the old General Motors factory, which gates off the historical train tracks. Okay, we have just reached the old GM plant, and if you can see, there's a railway right here where there's greenery growing right out of it. So you can, you can tell it hasn't been used in quite some time. They even fenced it off. Completely. It's becoming more of a walking trail now than anything. Okay, we are running out of sunlight and we do want to capture more stuff, so we are going to continue on our way to the Blue Ghost Tunnel. We did, however, bring a bunch of lighting equipment with us, so hopefully we will gather a lot of shots. Onward. Running out of sunlight, we rush to continue onward. As we walk, we start seeing history getting pieced together. The no longer operating railroad, built in 1872, can still be seen as we launch our drone into the sky. This is the exact same railroad two trains were using at the same time, later colliding full speed with each other on January 3rd, 1903. This caused firemen from both sides to later perish. This all happened 100 yards west of the Blue Ghost Tunnel. 
Okay, we have just finished our walk. It was about a kilometer long, so it wasn't too bad, but we have reached the trail which we're supposed to go down in order to get to the actual front of the Blue Ghost Tunnel, the entrance. So what we're gonna do is go down the steep hill. We have to cross this little railing here and hopefully, hopefully we can navigate all the, the bushes with the camera equipment and stuff, but I think we'll be able to do it. It is getting really, really dark really fast, so we need a light, which we have. And yeah, onward. Let's go check it out. We did meet some some uh, interesting people that were locals. They were playing the saxophone inside inside the Blue Ghost Tunnel. And apparently, they're doing it for acoustic purposes, and they showed us on their on their phone what it sounds like, and it sounds pretty cool. So, I think we go right. Yeah, we go that way. Okay, I'm following you. So it's getting dark really, really fast. We just took, like, took care of our drone footage. So now that we have that out of the way, we can go explore. Watch your step here. Okay, you wanna show this? Yeah. It's a really steep hill. It might not look that steep on camera, but believe me. Oh uh, yeah, there we go. Just put our rope down here. Yeah, that's a good idea. I can see it, it's right there. Oh. I don't know if you can see it through the trees, but. Let's try. Okay, it's, it's only getting steeper and steeper. Ooh, the air changed, did you feel that? Yeah. Yeah, I can immediately feel a tension. It's very cold. My producer just mentioned he, uh, he just felt the temperature flux fluctuation. It keeps going from hot to cold, from hot to cold. We're here. And as you can see, while I'm talking, my you guys can see my breath. That's how, that's how eerily cold it is here. It's a weird, eerie experience. I can't really describe it. Like most of the places we went to on this documentary, it's very indescribable. That's the gate. I believe it's usually left open because there's no lock on it, but... Um, the tunnel's fairly long, it's not overly long because half of the tunnel is missing. It's completely flooded, so unless you're a scuba diver, you can't really access it. So we'll the thing is with tunnels this wide and this long is you hear every single little echo every little noise that happens inside of it you hear so even if a drop of water hits the the water that's that's flooded the tunnel you can hear it and it echoes throughout the whole tunnel and you get completely discoordinated you don't know where it's coming from if it's behind you to your right side to your left side in front of you it's just very discombobulating so anyways we're going to continue into the tunnel and I'm gonna let you go first. We are in the tunnel right now, and the first thing we notice is this pungent smell of maybe burning rocks, burning stones, if that makes any sense. It's like a dirt, very dirty smell, a little sulfur. So there was obviously a fire here at some point. And another hot take is that there's candles laid out through the whole entire tunnel. They're these tiny little tea light candles. They're bigger candles. There's different types of candles. Some of them even have little, uh, you know, Christian beliefs on them. A uh, picture of Jesus or the Virgin Mary. And it's just a little uneasy to, to be here. You guys can still see my breath. Um, it actually got a little bit colder in the tunnel, obviously, but that's totally expected because it is a tunnel and it is very wet down here. Now, we haven't seen any bats yet, but bats are a common thing for, for tunnels of this size, especially it's always dark here. There's never any lights except uh, for tourists and locals to come down here. So what we're gonna do is continue down there. It is gonna get wetter and wetter as we kind of climb down it, as we go deeper in. Huh, that's a seagull. I thought that was like... <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna use my phone to record my producer. There we go. 
it's well like you keep saying the atmosphere changes right so like you can feel it in a temperature change but there's also a denseness in the air that's kind of like an energy change it's a little bit lower of like a vibration i guess you could say So the unfortunate part is majority of the world is covered in graffiti. So no matter where you look, even these perfectly preserved areas, they are just covered in graffiti. And it's kind of interesting how people express themselves in areas like this. You know, you have some smiley faces, you have some, you know, profanic words, you have pictures and images of sometimes more demonic things. You have pentagrams and, you know, things, things of that nature. So. We're gonna continue on. There's really not much left that we can walk because like I did mention, you need like a scuba suit in order to get down into the flooded area, but let's continue here. It's starting to drip from the ceiling. The, the floor is getting extremely, extremely uneven. Very, very muddy, very slippery. And the beam is just getting lower and lower. So we have to essentially duck our heads. And that's that. If we continue any further, then we're just gonna get extremely wet. So what we're gonna do is just stay quiet for a little bit, see if we can hear anything abnormal and just feel out the energy. Okay, we just exited the tunnel. Feels like a, like a boulder just got removed off of me. It was very, very intense inside there. I don't know, I, I, again, I can't really describe it, but yeah, and it's a little disorientating because when you talk, when you speak inside the tunnel, you're, it just reverbs the whole entire tunnel and it sounds like other people are talking it just, and it makes your voice much much deeper and it just echoes everywhere very very surreal so since we're out front of the tunnel right now just above me is basically where the railroad is so so in the, in the beginning of the 1900s when those two trains collided the express train and the 80 ton train just completely obliterated each other and you know the firemen that got launched into the boiler, boiler rooms and, and just got minced. Obviously their remains haven't been found. Uh, most of their remains have been left, like left there so we can't really determine the exact position of where the deaths happened but it is about 100 yards away from here so that's roughly a football field. So what we're gonna do now is continue along the trail and we're gonna see what the feeling is above the tunnel back up on the on the road there so we'll figure it out Let's march onward right here i just passed by a scent very very resemblant to sulfur now that's a totally normal thing especially with rebarb and and concrete that's reinforced with metal metal has a really good retendency to smells so you're gonna smell the, essentially the history of what happened here. As this hill keeps getting steeper and steeper, we're basically going forward into the darkness. I can see the surface from here. Pop this bar. And we're out. Wow, that is a big change, eh? It was like winter and now it's like spring. Leaving the rough terrain of the tunnel, we continue walking back to our vehicle. While walking, we encounter an immediate strong smell that we can't explain. We mourn the poor firemen who lost their lives at this location in this tragic accident. Returning home, we start preparing for our final destination, the historical Drummond Hill Cemetery. The first graves inside the cemetery are of the original settlers. Most of these settlers were originally buried on their farms and later relocated to the Drummond Hill Cemetery. 
The first body was a man by the name of John Birch, which died in 1799. This heritage site is also the resting ground for the famous Laura Secord. On July 1814, the Battle of Lundy's Lane took place as 876 British and Canadian soldiers were killed, wounded, or captured. This land captured many moments in history and people's lives. We are here today joined with historical documents dated back to the original newsprints specifying grave sites, articles, reported bodies, and more. Alright, we have made it to the Drummond Hill Cemetery. This is where the Battle of Lundy's Lane happened in 1814. So let's kind of go through the gate and check it out. So right now, we are going to try to find the grave of Laura Secord. This is where she was buried, this exact same cemetery. Now, on the map that we've read, she is over there. So right next to the Laura Secord Monument, we have a fenced off grave. Now, fortunately, you can't read any of the writing on it. And that's how the story is with most of these graves. You cannot read anything on them. They're so old that just time kind of washed, washed all the letters away, all the engraved stones. So let's continue on here. So this almost looks more like a tomb than a grave, like your casual gravestone. So it's kind of unique that the family decided to fully fence it off. The only legible writing I can see here is the, the letters L-O-R. Okay, so directly behind me is the Pescatarian Church. This is, has been remodeled throughout the years and renovated, so it doesn't look like the original pictures, but that's kind of with anything, right? Wear and tear over history. So we're gonna continue along this path and we're gonna find older graves. Hopefully we'll, we'll stumble upon the original settlers, the pioneers, where they're buried. There's a prime example of a really old one, so 1894. Some of these are actually extremely close right next to each other. It's kind of almost uneasy, you know. This is a smaller one, so I don't know, it could have been a, a child or something. So the official story that happened here was the Battle of Lundy's Lane. Now, people that pass by the cemetery or walk through it at night sometimes see soldiers. So the Redcoats, the British soldiers, the Americans that, that passed away in this land. Kind of creepy, the sun is already set, setting down. So it's already, uh, the vibe is changing in the atmosphere. So the odd part about this specific cemetery is that it doesn't seem very structured. Uh, a lot of the modern cemeteries, they're very, very organized. This one, it, it doesn't seem to be in like any type of order. All the old stones are buried right next to the new stones and so on and so forth. So for example, prime example right here, you have a stone that you can't, you can barely even see. You, can't even read anything on it. It is so cracked, beyond repair. And then right behind me, there's some of the newer stones. So 1904, this one looks a little bit better. So if this is the condition of the 1904 stone. I could only imagine what year this is. Yeah, the the emotional aura right now is getting a little, little intense as the sun starts setting. It's almost, uh, we have about, 10 minutes of sunlight left. And if we see a soldier walking, well, we'll be the first to see it. So you can almost tell immediately the financial situation of the people that were buried here. Some gravestones are enormous and some are, well, some look like this, really tiny. This one says mother, Alan, and this one's father. And there's a really odd gravestone that I noticed. It's actually on the path, so. This one just says the number 11, so. It could be a gravestone, it could be something else. It could be a way to organize it. Let's continue on here, because this whole entire section, almost directly centered into the cemetery, is completely fenced off. 
This is almost a very personal, very private experience. I think for the family members. Now I can only see three gravestones here. These could have been the ultra wealthy, the filthy rich, and a massive tree kind of encompassing it. I can only imagine the roots just dig extremely deep under. And I guess you can picture the rest. I'm trying to avoid to walk on all these people that passed away, but it's, it's so hard because they're so close together and there's gravestones everywhere. What's interesting is you can see some of the, the people's religious beliefs directly on their headstones. So for example, this one right here, this is Fred Yokes. He passed away in 1828 and he has a Freemason sign directly on his headstone. So if you want to check this out. Just right here, we got the Freemason sign when he was born, when he passed away. It's interesting to see how creative people got with the headstones back in the mid 1800s. This is John Bender. He died in 1852. And there's a hand pointing up at, at a dove. Not too sure what that means, but it's quite a view. As we end this investigation, we mourn the lives of the soldiers and settlers of the Drummond Cemetery. As historical explorers walked these grounds over 200 years ago, we notice maybe times haven't changed too much. Technology helps us better document these events and findings. Boundaries are only set by yourself. We each have history behind our ancestors, and that's powerful. My name is Val Coles, and this is me signing out.